Welcome back to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm in conversation with Dr. Hans Paul, the global chairman of BCG. Hans, tell me a little bit about your impression now of India because I, I saw you giving an interview soon after Prime Minister Modi had come to power and he said that, well, you know, here's this man who's, you know, who's, who's exuding investor confidence. It's been 20, 22 months uh, since he came to power. Give us an honest assessment of, of, of how you see him and how does the investor community see him? Well, clearly expectations were high, expectations are high, but I think every change takes much longer than we all would like uh, to, uh, to give. And that's true for the Indians, that's true for the foreign investors. I think overall we see progress, we see the right movements, um, and we have to be patient and persistent. Right, and GST is of course, you know, is, a, is the perfect example of, of what political acrimony can do to reforms. So, in, you know, we were having this conversation a short while ago, considering this political acrimony that, that, that one is seeing in India, even are you, like, sort of, uh, is the investor community also sort of keeping a close eye on, on, on what's happening and the fact that whether this is beginning to seriously hurt reforms? Well, of course, people are anxious for this to happen. They also see the conflict between government and opposition, um, but they also expect compromise. So uh, I think uh, BJP is positive and pro-GST. So was Congress mm -hmm. for many years when BJP actually was making life more difficult for Congress. Mm -hmm. So the issue now is to get together and find a solution and get it done. In fact, last time, in fact, the interview that I'm referring to, you also talked about the time it takes for permits and, you know, and how difficult it is to sort of, you know, do business. Any, any change since then? Since well, at yeah. least 20 to 22 months is a, it's, it's not, it's not a very short period either. I mean, That's one true. can, of course, you know, look at that and, and, mm. you know, and, and then yeah. sort of predict in some one way or the other which yeah. way, you know, the next three and a half years will go for us, yeah. for this We've seen, now. we've seen actually some progress. Uh, a number of companies, both Indian and foreign companies have seen, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, their investments uh, really taking place and uh, permissions have been granted. So we see progress, but of course people always want things to go even faster. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But yes, we have seen progress, but yes, also we would like to see even more progress. Some of the key reform areas then, Hans, that you, know, that you think that the government really needs to now, you know, needs to get moving now, beyond yep. just the hyperbole and the, and, the, and the headline statements, needs to get moving. Well, you know, I think ultimately, of course, we're talking about labor market reforms, um, land reform uh, and, and land acts, especially of course with different um, states, I think these will be key. But then the overall ease of doing business, getting uh, permits for imports, for exports, um, making sure that, um, you know, when you do develop business, and I'm talking primarily first about for the Indians and then secondly for the, for the foreigners, I think for the especially for the small businesses, it should be easier so that they are not really subject to the enormous pressures in bureaucracy uh, because jobs will be created because lots of small and mid-sized businesses will flourish. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to make sure that they can really flourish and not being suffocated. Right, right. Has the investor community been most sanguine, optimistic about India now? Or no, I, I think they are. I think we've seen progress. Uh, I think people really see India as a, a great opportunity, um, and that's why they are pushing. But that's why they are also uh, quite impatient. Um, okay. That's why a lot of discussions are happening, um, and uh, there's always a tension between expectations on the one hand, reality on the other hand. Reality always comes a bit short of, of expectations, but. Um, Overall, I think progress is happening. Um, people are quite positive, but of course they want more. They want more and faster progress. In the context of what we just discussed in the first segment, which was, you know, what's happening globally, okay, in that sense, you know, IMF has, 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 has indicated on some occasion that India will be the bright spot. So in that, in, you know, in, in such a global scenario, the importance India takes? I mean, India is still a relatively small the economy relative to China or uh, other parts of the world. And even if you grow by 
seven percent, even eight percent, it's still a relatively small addition to the global GDP mm -hmm. in absolute terms. And I think one, again, one needs to put this into perspective. Now, if we see for the next five to ten years, mm. seven, eight percent, or maybe even more, then I think uh, India in ten years' time, in 2026, uh, I think will be a real massive global growth engine. Yeah. Right. At the moment, its role is still somewhat smaller because it, of the sheer size. You talked about the IT sector and uh, you know, and the fact is, there's, of course, there's a larger global debate on the role technology is going yeah. to play going forward. Fourth Industrial Revolution, that was the theme even at Davos. So in that sense, the opportunity and the challenges that poses for a country like India? Well, first of all, I would uh, emphasize the opportunities. Um, uh, India having such large numbers of uh, software engineers, engineers in general, IT specialists, people who will create businesses. And uh, we've seen lots of Indian companies coming up, lots of, of uh, young Indian people really creating their own business, and that will um, bring a lot of momentum. So India will benefit from this uh, uh, digitization of the, of the economy. Um, and I think it will also, when we think about Factory 4.0, it will allow India also maybe certain even to, to jump over certain developments because they can bring IT to manufacturing faster than maybe some other countries mm. who don't have the same talent. So I think that's a huge opportunity. Now the question is, we also have hundreds of millions of people relatively little educated and little skilled. Yeah. Can we bring them into uh, the labor market? Um, and I think that depends a lot on whether we remove a lot of uh, the obstacles to doing business in yeah. services, in, in mm -hmm. consumer goods. I mean, there's such a large market. Why should India not produce lots of consumer goods, but also investment goods, transportation equipment um, for themselves in aerospace and defense? Right. Again, a huge market right. in Indians. Uh, should be able to produce a lot for themselves. Right, because because one issue also that is associated with the fourth industrial revolution is of the increased automation in jobs. Yes. And you know, and the problem is that there are 12 million people joining the workforce every year and if more and more jobs are getting automated, then that clearly poses a big challenge. And how can the government and public policies be attuned to, to meet that challenge? Yeah. But I think, you know, there, we, in services we need lots and lots of people to do a good job. But uh, if you prevent people from opening their businesses, very often it's simple businesses, uh, then I think people will not find those jobs. Not everything will be automated, and they will not, it will not be, they will not be auto automated, or the jobs will not be automated just, um, you know, from today to next, uh, to tomorrow. I think we need to create the, the, the whole uh, space uh, for people to establish themselves and to try out things and eventually some will be done by robots maybe but uh, it really depends on how easy it is to to really create those businesses right uh, I don't I think we need to be careful not to create uh, a spirit and in Europe that happens a lot that you know all the jobs will be wiped out and will be done by machines or by robots that's right. what's going to happen right yeah, because it's, it's also not economic to, uh, to automate everything. Generally, in terms of the perception that private sector has, is is not very good, and that assumes significance in the context of the rising inequality levels. Oxfam report recently came out. So, in that sense, how you know how will private sector deal with this? Because because public policies cannot work for the private sector. Regulations will continue to choke the private sector till the time the private sector also creates a space of you know you know for the government to make reforms because I mean if your image is so battered the government will also be hesitant to making those changes for for the benefit of the private sector so how will how will how will the industry emerge out of this this image crisis yeah. well first of all we have to understand that income equality has improved significantly globally because the emerging markets have really caught up so I think uh, the divide within the world, the global world, has really shrunk. Now, we've seen in quite a number of uh, countries um, that inequality has been rising uh, in some emerging markets, some developed markets, but 
I think by, by taking extreme uh, examples, a narrative that Oxfam, for example, used, um, we are not helping the discussions. Because the idea that business is bad and, and public is good or government is good, I think uh, clouds the, uh, the fact that governments are not creating jobs. They are creating an environment in which business can operate more or less well. And, uh, and the large majority, the large majority of business people are doing a good job. They are creating um, jobs, they are creating opportunities for really having a decent living. And by focusing on some extreme examples, something that happens in the US or in Mexico or in some African context, you know, we are not really helping the discussions. Um, I think by, um, by creating an environment where people can really take life into their own hands as entrepreneurs, as business people, as employers and employees, I think we are creating a much better overall development. If you see the extreme um, developments that we've seen in Venezuela, for example, where uh, the government has essentially um, taken over from, from business and we've seen what it has done to society, we, we also clearly understand that why uh, this is the, absolutely the wrong way. Mm -hmm. It has uh, really brought a, brought a lot of misery to many, many people. Crime, uh, unemployment, uh, even uh, scarcity of food and other, other stuff. So I think what needs to be done is needs to be a very a good collaboration between the different parts in society, right. which means government and business, the unions, uh, civil society, and to understand that only by working together well do they benefit from each other, rather than saying one is exploiting uh, the other, and that's why we have to, uh, to push one group out or even push one group into a corner. Well, that's all we have time for on this edition of the CNBC TV 18 special. Until next time, thanks very much for watching.